Hello and welcome back to Ray's Gaming Videos. My name is Solo and we're back for a fifth set of things you didn't know in Elden Ring. My god, this game is big and there's still stuff that I'm learning after hundreds and hundreds of hours and this series has been really fun for me because of that. Every time we make a video, you guys are in the comments with things I didn't know and I get to include a few in the video. And upon even just a little bit of research, there's more interesting details that I've completely missed. So let's see if you missed anything in set five and can learn something useful for your benefit. First up then, I want to talk about an Ash of War on this very unassuming little club. This is the Flame of the Red Mains. And this is also quite an unassuming Ash of War, isn't it? Shooting out a sort of cone of fire, dealing damage at range. Pretty cool if you want to do some fire damage, especially as an Ash of War, and you can put it on a lot of good weapons. Like, for example, a basic club that only weighs three and a half weight and only requires 10 strength to use and nothing else, so very likely you can use this on any build. The thing about this Ash of War though is, it staggers. It's an incredibly effective ranged stagger to break the guard and posture of an enemy and it works on bosses too. The reason I know about this is because at the point in Elden Ring, challenge runs are becoming more and more popular as people want to replay the game in a more interesting way for themselves. And so they're trying, say, your soul level or real level one runs. This is perfect for that because you have a ranged stagger option as a level one that doesn't have high requirements in the case of this weapon. So let me show you it. A ranged interrupt in this case, and then a ranged stagger. Swap to your main weapon for a quick critical, and then of course it's got to recover and you get some free damage out as well. We've jumped into new game plus, we've got our first boss, first hit, second hit. That is so, so effective. And the fact that it works against, you know, any staggerable or posture-breaking enemy, like, say, the Gargoyles, the duo Gargoyles, that's such a good resource in that kind of fight. And look, again, only two hits and another stagger. And it goes pretty far. I can spam it out reasonably from range, get another stagger, only two hits to do it. Very impressive, really useful. You can work that into any build. And because it's so low weight with a club, you can use that. But depending on your stats, you could use something even lower weight. You can get that Ash of War then from here. This is the western point of Kaelid. Fort Gale North is the grace that you're going to want. Just below the Rockview Balcony grace. Immediately from your north, from that grace, we have an invisible scarab running around. And that is containing the Ash of War we want. As always, I recommend an AoE to catch out these invisible scarabs. They can be really annoying otherwise. Next, a weird one. Just a special attack that I had never seen before until very recently when I was made aware of it. As it turns out, some of the skeletons in this world can actually do a unique flying attack. I'd never seen this before. It's a very strange and surprising attack. This knight-like skeleton just stopped fighting me directly, did a T-pose, and then started flying from the gusts of his own, like, death vomit. Skeletons have access to a unique sort of necromantic damage thing, but it's not like black fire or destined death. It just deals damage. Imagine if that was an incantation we could do. You find these skeletons here on the north side of Lindell, or the northeastern point of the Altus Plateau. It's a whole graveyard area with many skeletons that do this attack. I've seen that nowhere else though, which is random and surprising. I wonder why only here. Next up, we're here to take a little look at some enemies you will know about. You may have experienced them for the first time in Kaelid in that cave that you were transported to, or maybe you found them much later in the game. But I think we all recognize the kindred of rot when we see them. These nightmarish insect centipede things have one of the most annoying attacks in the game and also a really irritating movement pattern, don't they? I suppose that matches their nightmarish appearance. Now, Josh made a interesting comment to me about, hey, maybe you should include this in a video. These nightmarish creatures are actually covered in human hands. As you can see, they line the sides of them like that of the centipede's arms or legs. But yeah, it's, it's little human hands and... I, at least with this baby one, they do like like little baby or, or children's hands. It's a deeply uncomfortable thought that I'd never actually realized. And it made me think, hang on a minute, could these be grafted on there? Grafting is of course a major part of Elden Ring and this universe. It's not like Godric was the only grafted creature in this game. You can see those hands here with the talisman, the kindred of Rot's exaltation. Flourish in distant lands and return to us the unwanted children. It sounds like maybe the kindred of rot are these unwanted children. These monsters that were born 
of what, I wonder? Ultimately, they are very strange creatures. And with uh, that design in mind, yeah, human hands just coming out of the side of them. Why? Let me know what you think in the comments. This next one's kind of a little PSA. Maybe some of you know about it or are aware of it, but don't know the true value of it. There is a way to get your Wondrous Physic to be very beneficial to any build. Take my Wondrous Physic on this build. What I am currently running are two katanas that are dex based, not bleed based, and there's no elemental or holy or magic effect to them. I would love to enhance the power of this build in some way, right? Making it stronger. If it did magic damage, I could make it do more than magic damage, or fire, or lightning, or holy. Even if it was, say, a build all about doing heavy attacks, I could make that better. My best option would be the consecutive attacks in this case. But there's actually a universal Wondrous Physic buff we can use to benefit any build, and that's the Winged Crystal Tear, which will reduce your equip load for three minutes. This gives you plus 450% weight limit for three minutes. So I could slam on some of the heaviest armor with the highest poise and the highest defense that I have at the time and then pop this wondrous physics. So I go from my fat heavy rolling immediately back to fast rolling for three minutes. So I can greatly reduce the damage I take, give myself lots of physical protection or maybe magical depending on what armor you've got on. And then more importantly, the poise. And technically you could do this in PvP jewels. God help me if I open up that door when you can just go ahead and trade using this wondrous physic and the buff of the heavy armor. Most fights aren't gonna last three full minutes, whether it's a boss fight or PvP. So this could be very beneficial. So if you're not sure what to run in your wondrous physic, Consider this, before a boss fight, before PvP, or wherever. You'll need to visit this minor Erd tree at the northeastern side of the Altus Plateau, and then simply pick it up off the ground. There's no actual guardian, a group of mobs are there, but that's not too hard to deal with. You can run and pick this up. Next up, a tip that comes from you guys in regards to my last video, where I was talking about the Law of Regression, which is a really funny <laughs> ability that cleanses the enemies of their buffs, which is particularly relevant in PvP, where you're dealing with someone who's got a lot of buffs on them, especially in duels, where before every damn fight some guy's got six buffs and he's taking several different potions he's stimmed out of his mind and then you quickly lower regression cleanse all of that see him panic because his build's no longer relevant and then you get an easier fight which is very funny but in that video i did mention like oh you just need to have like the 10 fade to make sure you can actually use it and you're good to go i had no idea but as you can see on this build i do not have 10 fade to use my seal i have one too little at nine faith and plenty of intelligence to use intelligence incantations of which there are some like, yes, Law of Regression and Law of Casualty. As two examples, you can see, I do not have the faith to use the seal, and yet, I am able to cast the incantations that just require intelligence without any issue. As they are not offensive incantations, it doesn't matter that they're not getting the scaling of the seal, I just need the effect of the incantation, and I can get it without actually meeting the requirements, which is actually... Yeah, really useful, right? Something I definitely didn't know, so thanks to you guys. Now, you might remember this shield. This is, of course, the Erd Tree Great Shield, which has a really interesting effect. The Golden Retaliation Ash of War, where when you take in, say, an incantation or a sorcery that's about to hit you, you retaliate with a parry, essentially, and send that attack back at them. Unfortunately, there are ways to abuse this shield, as we talked about damn near the original release of the game. By using self-damaging incantation, you could actually just supercharge the shield and permanently shoot off that missile like a turret or something. It was a bit broken and unfair and they obviously fixed that, but then it left the shield kind of awkward and unused. Well, in the recent patch, there was a buff to the Rings of Light. So we have uh, the solo one, the discus, and then we have the triple one like this one right here. Now, as you throw it, it does damage and then comes back, which is pretty cool. So you can actually throw out these rings and then use the shield and block it and send out your shot again using your own self-inflicted retaliation. Which is really cool because it makes the shield and that build a bit viable. With the buffs of these specific incantations, the rings of light, like say the AOE one, the single target one, or of course the triple one, you have options here to do a really cool faith build using the shield. Yeah, it's a pretty cool idea, I think, where you've got the rings and you're doing the reflection, then you're bouncing that off the shield and sending off another missile. As you can see me doing against these giants, where I'm sending off the occasional missile for some extra damage. Now, bear in mind, this is not a build set up for this, just a showcase that you can do this. And I wonder what kind of damage you could pull out with this kind of bouncing Beyblade situation. Next, we're here back on the beaches with the land octopuses. Oh, well, we were anyway. As you take a look at this footage, you have some interesting details to see 
about these guys. Obviously, we've been talking about them recently in this series, but yeah, we just keep coming back for more, apparently. Uh, if you may not have known, they actually have the ability to eat themselves to heal. They consume one of their longer arms, and it gives them a healing effect, which is quite unique, quite gross. As it turns out, they can also grow these back and, I guess, infinitely eat them. Just a permanent source of flare food. However, if you are dealing with a land octopus that's a bit of a difficult one, like maybe the ones that we find later in the game, what you should do is you should actually target those long limbs and break them off. And if you break both of them, it takes a burst of damage and a stagger, which is very useful, giving you the opportunity to do some real damage to its head, leaving it exposed. So yeah, not only do these things have a unique consume animation, but they also can eat their own arms, heal, regrow them back, and have a unique weak point, which is really cool. I mean, there's so much to just one enemy type. I would love if we saw more of that in this game, where there's enemies that have direct weak points that we can target and get benefits from on a grander scale, beyond just the golems with the glowing body parts and these octopus. Something that we've talked about in the series recently is, of course, the Sentry Torch, which can reveal secrets, illusions, and hidden enemies, those that can be even invisible. A very, very useful item, all in a torch. So it makes sense that we should talk about another torch that is also very useful and pretty cool looking as well. This is the Beast Repellent Torch. And as per its description, torches such as these were used to keep away unwelcome beasts from treasure troves hidden in, say, caves. The idea is that it pacifies wild beasts, and an obvious example of that would be wolves. So take some wolves here. As you can see, they will acknowledge me, but they will not attack me. They are afraid of the flame. As you can see, they're going to circle me, which is a pretty cool effect. But I can just walk on by, and it's completely fine. It will only actually cause aggro if I directly attack them. And the thing is, only the ones I directly attack will attack me. So I can take these big groups of wolves and enemies and take them one at a time, which is so much easier than dealing with a pack, which is how they're supposed to fight, because that's hard for you to deal with. It's really cool AI, but I imagine plenty of you thought, oh yeah, I could probably use that against wolves. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't. It is worth doing, especially early game. But here's another enemy it works on. The absolutely nightmarish and really annoying Basilisks. These guys are so irritating to deal with, especially when you're dealing with a pack of them. Well, as you can see, the Beast Repellent Torch has pacified them, so they cannot attack me. As I walked in, they actually did attack me, but as soon as their the first attack goes out, they see the torch, they stop. So yeah, I'm able to take them on one at a time instead of in a pack, just like the wolves, making them manageable. And it's very cool that we can see how I take away the torch, they start attacking again almost immediately, and we pull back out the torch, and they go back to their pacified state, ever circling and very creepy looking. To get your own beast repellent torch, you can get it very early game. It is at the northern western point of Kaelid at the isolated merchant's shack, just here, quite near where we first come in at the Rockview balcony. As you can see, you can buy it from him from just 1,200 runes, so very easy to get early game, because it only takes 12 strength and 8 decks to use. This is definitely the torch I would recommend as a new player or a new build. Something you may have wondered, like me, is if the jump new in Elden Ring has iframes because sometimes it feels like I jump and an attack passes right through me. Well, I'm here to tell you that yes, the jump actually has iframes and its iframes are longer and better than that of the roll, which is quite the discovery, something very useful to know. The source of this information comes from someone we've talked about in the Cut Content series, Zully the Witch, who often breaks the game and finds really interesting details about it. It looks like Zully found that uh, from the hitboxes, we can see when you have iframes on a jump, which actually occurs for quite a long time, like I said, longer than that of a roll. But the problem is, it's only the bottom half of your player that actually is immune. Your top half is still vulnerable, so you may have found that you've jumped and been hit before, that's why. There are many attacks in this game that are like a shockwave slam or a low swing to take out your legs. Simply jumping over these not only is a good idea, but possibly the best idea in this scenario. And as you can see, I'm using a two-handed weapon, right? That raises my arms up compared to being one-handed, where I've got the left arm out here. By two-handing a weapon, you also make the iframes of the jump better because your arms are up higher. So if for some reason you haven't been jumping yet, do know that it has iframes and start considering the jump 
instead of the roll. But there you have it, another set of things you might not have known in Elden Ring, interesting or useful, or possibly just entertaining. If you have enjoyed the video, please do drop a like, but more importantly, if there's something interesting or unusual that you think could make it into this series, please drop it in the comments. I already have a good couple of ideas for set six, but more would always be appreciated. For now though, I've been Hollow, you've been you. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos, dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes, bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement to take our insanity and turn it into entertainment. Yes, I said entertainment twice to reiterate that it is nice to look into your faces on a mostly daily basis when you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage is uh, goodbye.